Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session of the Permit COE webinar series. Today, uh, Osman Flubach is going to talk about computer assisted, computer assisted functional precision medicine in cancer. My name is Daniel Tomas Lopez. I am involved in Permit COE on behalf of Embel EBI, and I am going to host this webinar. Before starting, I would like to make you aware that this webinar is being recorded, including the questions and answers section, and that the recording will be disseminated afterwards. After the presentation, we will have time for questions. So please use the Q&A uh, button in your Zoom panel for asking questions during the webinar. I will now introduce uh, Permit COE, the project. Permit COE is the HPC Exascale Center of Excellence for Personalized Medicine in Europe. Permit COE focuses on simulation of cellular mechanistic models, which are essential to translate omics data into medical actions. The performance of cell simulation software is still uh, not enough uh, today to address problems such as tumor evolution or finding personalized treatments for patients. So Permit COE will scale up the software for cell simulations to the present HPC XR scale systems in order to enable the creation of models of uh, cellular functions uh, with medical relevance. Permit COE will achieve this goal through a series of objectives. First, it will optimize selected cell level simulation software to run in pre exascale platforms. Second, Permit COE is developing a series of use cases that will showcase the applications of Permit COE products in different fields of clinical interest, such as drug synergies for cancer treatments or performing multi scale modeling of COVID 19 virus and patients' tissue. Additionally, Permit COE also has as objectives training the biomedical professionals in the use of HPC and Exascale Permit tools, integrating the Permit communities into the European HPC Exascale system, and building the basis for the sustainability of Permit COE. Let me now introduce uh, our speaker for today. Dr. Osmund Flubach uh, works in clinical oncology and research at the St. Olaf's University Hospital and at the Nor Norwegian University of Science and Technology. He is project leader for the ERA Permit Project Oncologics and for the RCN Project Resort. His work combined experiments in the wet lab, uh, cell lines, drug screening, sonograph experiments, and in the dry lab like building logical models for drug, drug combination response prediction. He is the lead developer of the drug logics pipeline for drug synergy and resistance predictions. And this pipeline produces models tailored to single samples for drug synergy simulation and prediction. So with this, Osmond, the floor is yours. Thank you. And now my presentation should be up. Yes. Yes, you can see it. So I'm going to say something about computer-assisted functional precision medicine in cancer. Uh, I live in uh, Trondheim. You can see it uh, in the map here uh, in the lower right. So it's in Europe, some distance from Central Europe, but not too far. So if you get a chance to come here, you should. Computer-assisted, I think that uh, everyone understands what this means. Functional precision medicine might be a new term to some, but all of these terms will hopefully be more clear throughout the presentation. So my main project is, as uh, Daniel just said, uh, computer simulation uh, of cancer biology and signaling in cancer cells and how we can use this knowledge and simulations to predict drug responses. Uh, a companion project to this is the Functional Precision Medicine Project pre-sort, where we cultivate cells from patients in the lab to expose the patient's own cells directly with candidate therapies for the patient and decide then upon what is the best acting agent for this particular patient. Uh, a third project is Oncologics where we do computer simulations on uh, historic data obtained at the Charité and Institut Curie. I'll get back to this um, also later. And lastly, uh, the past uh, year, one and a half year has also been uh, 
uh, having for in the implementation of a new precision medicine trial in Norway, where we uh, then assign therapies, experimental therapies to patients. So tomorrow's cancer therapy, what is that? I'm not going to discuss the far future, the distant future with fancy cars and these things. I'm going to focus on the very near future, which is the precision medicine era. And here to the right, you see the, this, uh, you see an example of colon cancer patients in the upper left part. And we don't really see any difference between these when they come to us as clinicians. And we assign them therefore more or less the same therapy. But then we do see the difference because some of these patients will respond to the therapy and others will not. And precision medicine is about seeing this difference in the responses before we assign the therapies. And this is actually not an easy task to do because biology is very complicated. Biology has been allowed to uh, evolve through trial and error over billions of years. And we come now in and try to understand this as engineers. And here's a cartoon from the 1930s. Uh, and this is somewhat uh, reminiscent of biology. So here you see Professor Butts, he is eating soup and he has this mechanism that will uh, cause this cracker to be uh, thrown into the air and the parrot is going to take it. Something is going to pour down here. That is going to drag the lid of this casket, which will ignite the rocket, which will cause this uh, line to, uh, to be cut and he can wipe his mustache. And this is reminiscent of biology in the sense that these things that act together, they are acting in cascades and they are not really designed only for this particular purpose. They have been reused by Professor Butts, which is also the case for many of the systems that we are trying to understand and describe in molecular biology. But we are now at the point where we do understand a lot of the biology and at the molecular level. So I'm going to say something about the biological mechanisms that we are describing in cancer. This is a somewhat dated picture because this is now more than 10 years old. Uh, so this is from the famous publication by Hanna Hanna and, uh, and Weinberg uh, on cancer and how we conceive cancer today at the molecular and cellular level. I'm quickly going through this. We know that cancer cells, and you see the tumor in the center, the cancer cells are the ones in gray, but the tumor itself is comprised of many other cell types like immune cells in pink or endothelial cells as part of the vasculature. The cancer cells in gray, they are uh, characterized by having a high genome instability and acquiring mutations or changes at an accelerated rate, which enables them to resist cell death, to survive in the energy depleted uh, environments. I mean, all cancer cells in the tumor, they uh, compete for the same small amounts of nutrients that are there. So they are very different from the healthy cells in the body that are, you know, surrounded by all of these nutrients. But they become experts at this. They uh, learn how to uh, sustain a proliferative signaling and at the same time evolve, uh, evade the uh, growth suppressing signaling. Uh, they learn how to avoid immune detection. This is central to the cancer immunotherapies that we have had now for almost 10 years in the market. They are able to divide indefinitely, much like the stem cells in the body. Uh, they can interact with other cell types, such as inflammation cell types, uh, to uh, propel their growth. At some point in time, a tumor and the cancer cells will learn how to invade locally and eventually also metastasize. And then, uh, then the disease becomes a serious problem and a deadly disease for patients. And with this growth, these tumors also have to sustain their growth by uh, recruiting new blood vessels or building new blood vessels. So this is a quick summary of how uh, we see cancer today. Uh, earlier this year, uh, Hanan came out with a, a new publication which uh, added four more traits to this wheel, but I think, still think this is a good starting point to uh, discuss cancer and the features of cancer. I'm going to say some extra words about stain proliferative signaling. So here um, is a cell with its uh, nucleus and the DNA, uh, which can be uh, the recipe then for gene expression. And you see a gene being transcribed here. Upon activation or upon uh, the transcription initiation by specific transcription factors. So these are proteins linked then in cascades to other proteins. Eventually, 
it can be linked to cell surface receptors in blue here that might be sensing growth hormones that flow by uh, in the blood vessel. And if there is a, a growth hormone attaching, then the gene program initiated might be one that sustains cell growth. And to add some names relevant to cancer, you could say that the, the blue one is EGF receptor, and then you have the BRAF and MEK proteins. Now, one thing that can happen, and which often happens in cancer then, is that this chain is broken and that some component acquires an activating mutation. So here you see BRAF now being constitutively active independently of the surrounding. This is a very common uh, gene defect in many cancers. And it can be, in principle, uh, treated with specific chemicals that block this particular protein. So this is a common mutation in, uh, in the malignant melanomas. Roughly half of the patients will have it, and they will have one specific uh, mutation where the amino acid at position 600 has been exchanged from uh, valine to glutamic acid, causing then the BRF protein to resemble its active, uh, active structure and essentially uh, rendering the cell nucleus incapable of knowing whether there is anything going out on the outside, causing it to grow or not. So the cell is going to conclude all the time to grow. So these are mechanisms. And uh, when uh, reading up for this seminar, I also looked into several of the previous ones. And I was happy to see that the mechanisms are so central to the, these talks. So here you see from the first lecture, this is Alfonso Valencia. Uh, speaking then about how mechanisms and the understanding is part of uh, research today in cancer and specifically simulation. Before going more into simulation, I'm going to say some more words about functional precision medicine. So uh, we and many other groups uh, in Europe and in the world are researching then ways to cultivate patient-derived cells. So in the PRESAR project, we obtain cancer samples containing cancer cells from patients uh, directly at operating theaters. And instead of uh, you know, freezing and killing off these cells and sending them for diagnostics, we keep them alive uh, with the right uh, humidity and temperature and all of these things. So now we can do two things in parallel. One is that we can uh, do drug screens for these patient-derived cells to test which drugs, which of the available drugs are the best ones for this particular patient. And in parallel, we can harvest biomarkers and uh, use computer simulations to simulate which drugs are the best ones for the patient. Now, why do we need two trajectories here? Well, I think that uh, from the computationally oriented side, we need this validation step. We cannot trust that the computer is going to be uh, correct just yet. That might be part of the future though. And at the same time, for the functional side, where we test the drugs on the patient cells, uh, the amount of material available to us is very limited. So we can only test a few drugs. We cannot test uh, thousands of potential therapies for one particular patient. So therefore, this goes together. The computational side will help us prioritize, and the functional validation step will help us uh, gain uh, confidence that we have found good therapies. And together, these form then uh, a basis for the decision support. So uh, here's an example from last year. So we have now included 60 patients uh, in this trial. Uh, so here you see uh, the chemotherapy SN38, which is the act active metabolite of Edentocan. That, that is a commonly used chemotherapy in colon cancer. And we can see that uh, as the days pass, uh, these cells at some dose will stop growing. While for other patients, we will not see this growth inhibiting property of the chemotherapy, hinting then maybe to the fact that this patient might be more sensitive to even to combat others than other drugs. And here's what it looks like in the lab. Uh, so we let uh, these uh, tumors, small tissue sections, so maybe a hundred micrometer in, uh, in size, grow in uh, well plates. And uh, we can see that after a week, they are larger in size compared to uh, if we use a drug, then we will inhibit its growth. So that was the functional precision medicine side of it. Now I'm going to say some words about the, the computational side to it, which is then the drug logics project. 
And in particular, I'm going to say something about drug synergies and drug combinations. So back to this very simple uh, model for uh, BRAF inhibitors in malignant melanomas and other cancers. In fact, if you look at this cascade, you see that you could, in principle, have blocked MEK instead of BRAF, or you could even block the two together. And in fact, this is what is being done today. So most patients that uh, need the therapy for a BRAF mutated cancer will receive a combination of the two. So even this very simple model can help us appreciate this. Here you see still a very and highly simplified model of cancer signaling, but somewhat closer than to how we believe it is working with at least many tens, maybe hundreds, maybe thousands of components interacting in what we can describe as networks. And in these networks, these components can be genes or as is pictured here, proteins. Each node represents a protein. And you can see that there are many cross sections, many uh, places for feedback and for crosstalk. And if we were to block several of these pathways together, then we would start uh, thinking about the drug combinations. And then it is conceivable that some combinations are better than others. That seems highly probable, right? Just by looking at the picture. Uh, but the problem with combinations is that there are so many. So here you see to the left, the number of combinations that you would have uh, in pairs from single drugs, which increases exponentially. And this is even worse if you consider higher order combinations like three, four or five drugs together. And just for comparison, this almost flat line at the bottom, that is sort of the challenge where each new single drug represents an extra experiment. So the number of experiments uh, is still taxing for uh, our high throughput uh, facilities for this, for single drugs. So we are never going to be able probably to, uh, to comprehensively characterize drug combinations. So this is a point where computer simulations can help us prioritize. So here you see an early work from our group where we studied cancer signaling in a gastric adenocarcinoma cell line. And you see many components there. These are meant then to represent proteins and they can influence positively in green other components or negatively in red uh, yet other components. So there is both activation and inhibition. <clears throat> Some of these are in yellow and those were the ones uh, where we also did the wet lab experiments. Eventually all of these uh, informed cell uh, signaling with anti-survival and pro-survival signaling configurations. So we are doing this uh, biological modeling. And I know that several of the previous presenters have also described Boolean modeling and logical modeling. Uh, this is in itself a very simplified network of how biology behaves, because things are then not much graded. But we know, of course, that a drug can have a those response curve that the drags out over mag orders of magnitude in its concentration. So here you see from nanomolars to micromolars, and that there is a gradual decline in cell growth. But for other drugs, uh, they are in fact fairly threshold. -like. So here you see a drug which is within one order of magnitude, it's completely blocking growth of, of these cells. <clears throat> in any case, for both of these, we define them thresholds. Uh, and say that something above or below this threshold is uh, an effect or no effect of the drug. So this is one simplification that we and others use when we try to use Boolean modeling for, for a drug response prediction. And logical modeling, here you see protein, uh, proteins, that uh, there are two B proteins uh, informing on the activity in C and influencing C. And two simple logical equations could be to say that C is active when either B1 or B2 is active, or that C is active when both B1 and B2 are active. And you, if you think about this, uh, it is only in one scenario that you can in fact find drug synergy. Uh, because when you say or, then it means that you have to block this one and this one together. And it is only then that uh, you can block uh, drug target C. So 
Here we see a classical uh, signaling uh, network from molecular biology depicting AKT signaling, which is influenced by two upstream uh, protein kinases. And just to give you an example of what a logic equation might look like, AKT is active when PDK1 or mTORC2 are active. And here you see uh, we also add in a negative regulator of PDK1. So now PDK1 is active when PIG kinase and at the same time not P10 is active. We could have said that PDK1 is active when now AKT is active when PDK1 and mTOR2 are uh, active. So that would be an alternative formula. Uh, we often say that proteins, when we define these networks, are active when either of upstream activating regulators are active. And at the same time, when uh, neither of the inhibiting regulators are active. So, in this early work we did, we curated this network of cancer signaling components. Uh, I should say not cancer signaling because these are probably very important components also to healthy cells, but they are also important to uh, uncontrolled cell growth. And for each of these components, we then assign such logic equations. And uh, we then contrasted this with experiments in the wet lab. And we could see then that for several of these, there was uh, a high concordance between what we found in the uh, computer in the upper panel with what we found in the lab in the lower panel. So we could find drug synergies in the computer model that we could also observe in the lab. Then we also had, uh, well, I have to say surprisingly few false positives and no false negatives, so, but there was one false positive prediction. Uh, during my PhD, we then continued with automation of uh, this uh, manual work, and uh, this was also followed up by John Sobolas, a previous PhD candidate in my group. So many of these processes are now automated, and that's the anti new drug logics software. And I'm going to present it in, 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 in some uh, detail. So here we set forth to make computer models automatically, and we take two starting points. We take in the prior knowledge, which are the mechanisms that have already been described by others in literature or in databases. Typically, these are represented as networks or topologies that, in, that tell us how components jointly affect cell fate signaling. And this is also where potential drugs will act and block activities, typically. Now, the other uh, input to the pipeline is a set of measurements. This could be mutations or it could be protein activities as observed in the cancer system or the cancer cells that we are going to simulate. So from these two inputs, we then define logic models that are derived from the prior knowledge network and compliant with the observations for the particular cancer system. Uh, and then such networks can be used for drug response simulations and validated either in the functional assays or at least in some sort of experiment until you can have confidence in your pipeline. I'm not going to go through all these details, but here you see the software modules. So we have this central module that takes in the prior knowledge, the mechanisms and the measurements and formulates them an ensemble of models. So for each, cancer system, each cancer cell line, or in principle, each patient, we will define hundreds or thousands of models that will next be used for the drug response simulations. For those interested, you can find the extensive documentation, etc., at our GitHub account. And uh, this work is also described in a Vioxy preprint and currently in review somewhere. So central to our, how we define the logic models are genetic algorithms. So these are computational optimization algorithms and inspired then by nature, uh, as uh, described by Charles Darwin and others after him. And uh, they were first explored in computer programs from the middle of the 1950s uh, and especially from the 1970s and onward. So what is a genetic algorithm? It is an optimization algorithm that will search for some solution to a problem 
where you know some characteristics of a good solution. You might not know what is the best solution, but you know something about what is a good solution so that you can uh, evaluate so, uh, potential solutions. So for instance, if you want to create a cartoon of um, a famous character, you could start out with some uh, first, uh, first generation of samples. And then you run a simulation. Uh, and now this simulation has assigned, for instance, colors to some of your figures, and you will evaluate what are good colors. Uh, and based on the fitness, you will then choose some, select some for a next iteration. Now you're going to uh, introduce variations, a recombination and mutation as inspired in biology. Mutations are the random changes and recombination is the exchange of genetic material between individuals in a generation. So very much like how we humans are created with, uh, with our parents. And uh, with this variation, we now have a new generation of models. And we can again simulate and assign fitness and define a third generation. And this process can be continued until we reach some stop criteria, some performance criteria of the, of, of the last generation. And when we are there, we are happy with the result. As said, this is heavily inspired by nature. And we know that this is a very effective algorithm in nature, at least if you allow it to, uh, to keep working for some billions of years. Uh, mut mutations uh, are introduced between generations. And uh, here it could be a computer program, for instance, which then represents a chromosome and a changed computer program, which is a new chromosome. And we have this crossover, which is the exchange of material between individuals. So getting it back to the Boolean modeling, here you see uh, an, uh, a formula, a Boolean equation, that is intended to reflect the signaling activity of this protein here, which is influenced by several upstream components, some activating it and others inhibiting it. So here you see the three activating components, A or B or C has to be active. And at the same time, not the, any of the inhibiting components, which would be D or E or F. So these are inhibiting regulators. It's not drugs, right? These are, would be uh, intrinsic components to the cell that would block the activity of this protein target. And one alternative to this formula is simply exchanging this AND not with an OR. That is going to do something to the behavior of this equation. One other example is that we could take out one of these regulators and say that we disregard the state of F when evaluating the effect of the drug target or the protein. So these are two examples of alternative formulas then. And these are the formulas that we allow our genetic algorithm to explore over some generations, uh, over some hundreds or thousands of models. And getting back to this first manually curated network, which was comprising some 75 nodes, uh, we found that we could uh, very nicely predict the drug responses, in fact. Uh, so here you see those models that were defined then automatically using genetic algorithms. And what was surprising to us was that even the randomly calibrated models that were not trained to the particular features of this particular cell line, they were also very good at predicting the drug synergies. So what does that mean? Why are the randomly calibrated models so well? Well, maybe there is something then in the topology itself that is telling of which drug synergies we are going to observe. So as a next step, we defined a larger model. Um, and this return cascade 2.0. It was roughly the double size, so 150 nodes. And this is then the topology. And we uh, used the genetic algorithms to, uh, to train it for models that reflect on those observations that we have seen for this particular cancer cell line. And one thing that we could see that was that if we uh, improve on the training data, I mean, use more and more correct calibration data, then the models would perform better. But still, even those that are not calibrated uh, to anything, they perform better than a purely random one. So in, it doesn't show here, but there should be a flat line here at uh, around uh, 0.04, which would be a complete coin flip or a um, complete 
lack of knowledge of uh, what is a drug synergy. So the topology itself does something beneficial to the drug synergy predictions. But with good measurements and correct measurements, it also improves. And conversely, we looked at what happens with the prior knowledge network. So as you remember, proteins can positively or negatively influence the state of other proteins. And if we, for instance, do sign inversion, we see that uh, going from the curated model, we, we quickly get to a highly deteriorated predictive performance. So the prior knowledge topology is very important for the accuracy of our predictions. So I said, for those interested, you can find the documentations and examples in, uh, in our GitHub account. Then I'm going to say some few words about uh, our ERA Pediment project, Oncologics. So this is a project uh, run together with Institute Curie uh, and the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, Uppsala University and Charité in Berlin and Trot at once in uh, Greece. Uh, we have then joined forces to try to predict drug responses in patients that have already received therapy at either Institute Curie or Charité. Uh, so this is the first work package. Try to predict drug responses uh, for those patients that have already been treated. And then we are going to identify model failures and model successes and set up wet lab experiments with these functional assays and, can, and patient derived cancer samples to learn more about the mechanisms. Why is it that we for some succeed, others fail uh, and generate also new measurements for these and refine our uh, software frameworks to uh, improve our predictions. And we are going to test out several modeling frameworks. Uh, one of them is the one I showed you just now, but we're also going to test them out, uh, then the software is from instance, instance uh, Institute Curie and Barcelona Supercomputing. I know you have already seen some of these, the Maboss and the Fisiboss, etc. So these have been described in previous, in previous webinars. And uh, there are positions available within the Ada Pediment Network. So we have a PhD position open at NTNU, deadline June 15th. So if you're interested, let me know and you can apply. And there is a postdoc position available at Institute Curie. And here you can contact uh, Laurence Calzon, who is also then the creator of Mavos, uh, to learn more about the postdoc position available there. Okay, so where are we today? I often think of these early pioneers when it came to flights and uh, how many very clever researchers were trying to do this 120 years ago. And uh, here we see one early example. This is maybe today a funny picture, but I think already here you see a lot of cleverness because planes, they are inspired, I think, from birds. And the bird has the wing, which causes it both to glide through the air and to accelerate its speed or to propel it. But here you see, uh, one ingenious uh, part, which is to separate those into two. So the wing is now separated into the gliding function and the propellant function. And we know that many of these, uh, if you look in YouTube, you will see many that did not succeed. But eventually there were also those that could fly for some distance. And I think that this is where we are today in precision medicine. There are many patients uh, that we cannot help. And uh, for metastatic patients, it is very difficult to cure the disease. But still, there are examples that uh, tell us that those therapies that we today prescribe based on mechanisms, they do something to the mechanisms underlying the cancer. So in my last section, I'm going to describe to you a trial that uh, has been set up in Norway. It's been running now for one year. It's called Impress Norway and uh, improving public cancer care by implementing precision medicine in Norway. It's, full name then. So this is a trial that launched uh, April 1st, 2021. And uh, now we have had uh, around 350 patients through diagnostics. So these are patients with advanced stage disease and some uh, something uh, around 50 patients have then received therapies based on their particular genetic aberrations. 
So Impress Norway to the lower right, it's a trial that uh, is inspired by the Drupal trial in the Netherlands. And it's similar then in setup to the pro target in Denmark, Megalit in Sweden, uh, American trials, Finnish trials. So there are many trials that have quite similar protocols where you try to uh, prescribe therapies based on uh, mechanisms that you have characterized. So these trials and the Impress Norway trial is then a so-called umbrella and basket trial where we try to prescribe different therapies for different patients within one organ system based on mutations. So here you see the lung cancer patients can potentially receive three different therapies. And at the same time, it's a basket trial in the sense that you group uh, patient systems together. So for maybe a lung cancer patient should have the same therapy as a colon cancer patient, for instance, because they share something at the mechanistic level. Let me not say so much about this, uh, but uh, well, I can say that this is a, a bottom up and a top down trial in the sense that this is bottom up. It comes from the academic uh, groups at university hospitals. And at the same time, this has been well aligned with what authorities uh, are seeking in Norway and also in many other countries. Here you see an example of uh, a molecular tumor board meeting where we discuss the molecular findings of particular patients. Uh, we get out uh, global characteristics like tumor mutation burden. So how many mutations do you have per megabase? And we get out specific mutations. And this is where we are at today, I think. Like the early aviators, we every now and then we stumble upon something that we think we understand and that we can act upon. So here you see the flowchart. So patients that have advanced stage disease, they get diagnostics. They get discussed at the molecular tumor boards, where we go through all of the mutations found for individual patients and assign them what we believe can be uh, a potentially beneficial therapy for the patient. And uh, for some uh, 10, 20%, they are then assigned to a therapy. But for the majority, they in fact get no therapy because there is nothing available uh, in terms of mechanisms that we understand or in terms of drugs that actually can do something to it. And this is where we need the simulation. Uh, in this characterization of the genetic makeup or the molecular makeup of the individual patient's cancer disease. This is where we have to move from the very naive uh, reasoning today that single mutations uh, means specific single therapies into assessing many genetic changes together and many molecular changes together and assigning probably many drugs jointly for each patient. Still, as the early aviators, we are already every now and then hitting on something very powerful. And I can mention that in around two weeks, I'm going to meet the first patient I included in this trial. So this was a man, he has allowed me to, to tell about his story, but this was a man, he was uh, in his mid thirties, he had a glioblastoma, uh, so a brain tumor, and he was in a recurrent stage. The tumor was analyzed and we found this mutation, the BRAF V600E mutation. So it is a mutation we know well from other diseases like malignant melanoma and lung cancer. And he received therapy similar to what we then uh, prescribed for those other diseases. And uh, not too much is known about uh, its effect in, uh, in glioblastoma, but we had some reason to believe it could be effective. And for this patient, after eight weeks of therapy, uh, there was no visible sign of any tumor in the MRI scans. And he's now soon coming for his one year follow up meeting. And we are both uh, exciting, excited to, to see then how that goes. And this tells us that also, uh, as the early aviators, every now and then we are really able to pinpoint the mechanism for the individual patient. So with that, I have come to the end of my presentation. Uh, and uh, I've said some words about the directions for future medicine. I think it's going to include both the computational side and the functional side. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Osmond, for that uh, super presentation. Um, yes, so we are 
uh, you can we put uh, your questions using the Q&A uh, button in your Zoom uh, bar. Um, so I wanted to just to start with a with a maybe a general question, but what do you think it's the main barrier we have at the moment, or the main thing that is blocking us from maybe reaching the next step of aviation history? <laughs> Yes, I think uh, I, I think there are several barriers, and uh, one that I think uh, many in academia and in the hospital can relate to is the is the distance between those two sides. So the distance from a research setting to the clinical side. This is something that uh, has to be uh, uh, sh the distance has to be short, and th that distance has to be shortened both in terms of the competence. So medical doctors have to understand more of the basic research side and basic researchers have to understand the clinical side. So that is one aspect. Another aspect is uh, the legal side and uh, all of the barriers that uh, we humans have put in place uh, for good reasons to preserve, uh, preserve private information and these things. But still, this is also a barrier that we have to learn how to circumvent or to, to, to deal with most efficiently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, I agree. I agree on both, and especially the part of ethical, legal, and societal, societal implications is a topic that we really need to start um, addressing as well. It's, it's quite a worry. Yeah. It is uh, important for Europe to be aligned in this. Uh, Europe can be a superpower, but uh, we have are so many countries and so many entities that it's important for us to efficiently do that collaboration. And I also have to say that um, uh, when I include patients to clinical trials, uh, many of these are, I mean, in Norway, I think that uh, the legal system is uh, very conservative compared to what patients actually uh, want. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, okay. So we have a few questions already. Uh, the first one would be, what do you think is currently missing in the current two more boards? Yes, uh, I in the current tumor boards, uh, as established most places, I think that there has been a major focus in uh, single mutation, and that makes sense because that is also where the drugs have been tested for single mutation effects. Uh, I think that uh, we could advance that a lot by, in, uh, by establishing these functional assays. This is something we are working with uh, in Norway, and which we are uh, we are launching a center to bring that diagnostics also to this precision medicine framework, uh, the IMPRESS framework in Norway. So that center is has a kickoff in August later okay. this year. Okay, I think that is one very central thing that is missing. Yeah. Uh, of course, also there are multiple data types. I don't think that we are very good at. Uh, at analyzing these together. I think we are still too focused on the single mutations and not really able to characterize the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. For instance, the transcriptomic uh, on top of the mutations or in relation to the mutations. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, another question. Uh, are you employing patient-derived organoids for drug screening and validation experiments? Or, uh, Yes, we use uh, something that uh, so in uh, in this functional precision medicine assays, uh, then organoids are at least to me those that are uh, derived from the uh, work on cell differentiation, uh, Hans Clevers and uh, other pioneers in that. Uh, another uh, large branch of functional precision medicine is this uh, spheroids, or where you take out not only individual cell types but rather lumps of tissue. So. Uh, for us, we do the last thing. We take out the lump of cells from the tumor, uh, meaning cancer cells, but also those other cell types that would be there. And uh, we are currently learning how to do this. Other groups uh, have also done this, to my knowledge, not prospectively for solid tumors. That has been done for liquid tumors, but not for solid tumors. But uh, there are several co-clinical trials or retrospective trials demonstrating effect. Uh, we are planning, as do I guess other groups, uh, planning for prospective trials now. So, but we have used the, uh, the first 60 patients that we have included to learn how to cultivate and to learn how to do these drug screens. Okay, okay. 
um, another question. Uh, when you incorporate patient data into your model, you aim to train the model to reproduce similar fixed points, or do you also aim to reproduce dynamical trajectories of the model? Yeah, it's a very good question. So we have focused mainly on the, mainly on the fixed points, but uh, the software framework can also take in uh, perturbation responses. Uh, and that is highly relevant when it comes to cancer cell lines, where you can generate a lot of perturbation data. And with these functional assays, you probably can also generate some dynamic trade, uh, data for, in, for individual patients. Then maybe you could also think that you could have a dynamic data for patients that are treated in the clinic, because at least a few dynamical pro properties you can assess by seeing that a therapy has a response or doesn't have a response after some months on that therapy. So we have focused on the fixed points, but uh, we can take in perturbation data and we are also doing that already, but we are mainly focused on the fixed points for now. Mm -hmm. um, another question. Yeah. Could you share your thoughts on what should we pay closer attention in context of black <coughs> effect prediction and prediction me precision medicine in upcoming years? Yes, uh, one, thing's, one thing that uh, quickly comes to my mind at least is the mechanism of the drugs to understand uh, what is it in the molecular biology landscape that we are acting upon uh, so that we can also then leverage all of that prior knowledge generated over the past few decades. <clears throat> but uh, others would also say here that uh, we should not be you know, biased by this prior knowledge. We should also be using more uh, unsupervised or um, uh, artificial intelligence algorithms that does not take in those assumptions about how mm -hmm. drugs act. But I think that there is a lot to learn from this, uh, this mechanistic perspective. So mm -hmm. that was at least one immediate thing that came to my mind when, when you asked the question. OK. okay. Uh, thanks for that. Um, another question. What are other examples for the PDK1 mtorc 2 towards SGK Act alternatives, alternative pathway case where the upstream proteins are drug targets? Sorry, did you get that? <laughs> uh, I, well, if, uh, if the question is if there are other examples about uh, joint upstream signaling. Yes, there are uh, numerous, and uh, one way to find these things would be in databases like uh, Signor, which is a very good database for uh, looking into these protein relationships, activate, activating and inhibiting relationships. So developed by Livia Perfetto and others, the Niruma. Um, one example that we did uh, describe was this BRAF and MEC pathway. I mean, that is a sequential pathway, so it's not a parallel, which would be then the PDK1 mTOR2. But uh, th those are uh, those are uh, two two interesting uh, different approaches to drug synergies. Should you target things in parallel or should you target things in sequence, for instance? I don't mm -hmm. know if this was a good answer, but I don't know if I fully understood the question. Um, I. I think that might answer the question they just said if uh, the that attendee said if you could type the, the name of the database. Oh yes. If you have uh, your chat available there. I'll look up the URL as you give me the next question. Okay. Um, next question. Well, it says great talk. Uh, following you. your metaphor of aviation. Uh, would you think that we could learn from the engineering way of doing things? I am thinking, for instance, of the standardization of parts and tools and the use of abstraction of complexity. Do you think that these or others could help modeling and systems biology? Uh, yes, I think that we can learn from uh, engineering, and I think that we are doing that. I mean, many of the mathematical frameworks that we are using, uh, differential equations and, uh, and uh, particular Boolean equations, they are used to describe engineering uh, systems. Uh, well, they can be used to describe nature, of course, as well, but uh, at least the Boolean equations, it's very easy to see the relationship with the electronics and that way of reasoning. Uh, but, uh, but surely we can take inspiration from that. And then I think we should also uh, be aware of the fact that uh, biology is developed over billions of years by trial and error. So it's also very 
difficult to look for the engineering principles as if it was, you know, designed to work in uh, in a specific way. I think this is it's very easy to to uh, to do that mistake actually. But uh, certainly, it is engineering and mathematics that uh, make us able to to tackle the large data sets that are facing us these days. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we have a couple more questions. Um, taking a prior knowledge network and perturbation data as, in, as an input, there might be a set of Boolean models that could equally describe the experimental observations. If this is the case with your pipeline, how do you deal with the many Boolean models inferred? Yes, uh, and that is also very true. And again, I see parallels to biology because there are several mutations, for instance, that can result in the same phenotype. And uh, surely we are seeing this also in the models that there are several model configurations that would all comply with a specific input uh, data set. And that is the question here. And maybe that different, those differences can only be appreciated upon simulations. Uh, and if so, we cannot know which one is the more correct. So what we are doing is that we simply simulate the responses for an ensemble of models, and then we do majority voting and say that something that is very often predicted is something that we believe in uh, more so. Uh, so that's a very pragmatic solution to it. But it is an interesting thing to try to understand the, the heterogeneity that we can observe when we perturb something and that we cannot observe before we do the perturbation. I think this is true both for the um, living biology system and for the computational system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, an attendee asks, uh, here in Brazil, one, difficult, one difficulty is the cost of these personalized drugs. How do you deal with this issue in Norway? Yeah, that's a problem in Norway too, yes. So when it comes to this IMPRESS Norway trial, where we have some uh, 13 drugs or something available, uh, this is in uh, partner, or this has been offered to us and funded by the pharmaceutical companies. So that is how it's dealt with in that specific trial. But when it co uh, comes to uh, prescribing something not approved uh, officially in Norway, then um, that is no easy thing. Someone has to pay for it, and then it might be the patient uh, himself or herself. And I think that the healthcare system in Norway is uh, also different from many other places in in the world in that uh, we pay a lot of tax uh, in Norway uh, to take part in the healthcare system where if something is uh, found to be effective and approved by authorities, uh, everyone has uh, will have equal access to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there's another question. Can you, and if no, how would you include multiomic analysis in your drug combination predictions? Yes, can you and if no. Uh, what we are doing then is that we take in, as I said, the prior knowledge, that's one thing, and then we take in the measurements. And the measurements we have to translate into activity values for the individual components in the network. And uh, here we don't really know what is the best way forward. We are exploring several tools to this end. Uh, and we have then been using uh, direct measurements of proteins and their modifications. We have measured the uh, transcripts, and it's not easy to infer then what is the signaling activity at the protein level. And the protein level is what we're trying to simulate. This is also where the drugs are acting. Um, and then we are exploring tools from, uh, from other collaborators, like uh, Julio Sass Rodriguez Group, and they have a lot of tools in place to try to uh, do those analyzes together. And there are many other groups that also can provide tools to this end. So they take in, for instance, mutation data, transcriptomic data, proteomic data, and try then to say something about the activity states on the protein level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we would be users of such solutions. And if any of the listeners here have good solutions, then, uh, then I'd be happy to know. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> um, OK. Uh, Drug responses predicted by logistic models and validated in vitro might still not work in vivo. Your comments on that? Yes, I agree uh, that they might not. Uh, that doesn't mean that a purely blind decision is a better decision, though. Uh, I'm hopeful that uh, 
uh, even though there will be misses uh, I, that we are better. And what are the reasons that uh, we are not, that, that we are probably never going to be uh, totally accurate? Well, if we rely on drug mechanisms, then it means that we need drugs with known drug targets. Uh, and uh, that these drugs act specifically on that target. And that is generally not the case. So these drugs, they are typically developed to block the ATP binding of proteins. So proteins, signaling proteins, they typically bind ATP and then they phosphorylate some target protein. And our chemical compounds, they typically block the ATP binding pocket. But that is also a very similar pocket shared between the different protein classes. So it's very difficult to have very specific drug inhibitors. Mm -hmm. Another reason is, of course, that the in vitro experiments are run for maybe days, uh, while the patient will receive therapy for months before we can really observe the effects. So those are two different time points. Also, many of the drugs, at least when it comes to the chemotherapies, they are prescribed uh, uh, every three weeks or so, sometimes a bit um, uh, with higher or lower frequency. And uh, in, uh, in, in the simulations, these drugs are then typically there all the time. However, for chemical inhibitors, you can say that it is somewhat more similar because chemical in, uh, small molecule chemical inhibitors, targeted therapies are often given as tablets and very often uh, at least once a day or maybe twice a day. So then you might start resembling something which is continuously present upon the cancer cell. Mm. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. there any drug dosage component embedded? Uh, that is also a good question. No, not uh, let me, really. let me just one second, Osmond. Yeah. Before moving to the last question, or if any yeah. other question comes in, I'm just going to uh, put the last slide. I think you can see it um, yeah. for the upcoming webinars. So people um, can read. just take a look at the webinars that are coming up, and also in the website they can watch the previous recordings. Um, and meanwhile, yes, we can we can answer the the last question that we have at the moment, and if there are any other questions, you have one more minute, <laughs> that it's, is there any drug dosage component embedded in your predictions and experiments? Uh, not really. Uh, we are mostly saying that a drug is active or not active on a particular component. Uh, this is one of the things that uh, we are exploring also in this ERAPEMET collaboration with the Institute Curie. Uh, which also has the capacity to do logic modeling, but with graded responses. So um, it is an interesting thing. And surely it's a relevant thing that, uh, that the doses, uh, that, that, that for instance, synergies, this is well known that the drug synergies, they uh, might be visible at particular drug concentration ratios, not at all, not at all of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I wanted to ask also a question. What what what's the relationship between the number of drugs that you include in your simulations and the number of drugs you include in the drug screening with with patient cells? Yeah. So in simulations, we can have thousands of conditions. In the patient samples, it's very difficult to have more than uh, ten for the moment. We are hoping to advance there, but. Uh, but uh, I'm sure that it is going to be limited to some very few tens of different therapies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, okay, okay. Thanks for that. Okay, thank you very much, Osmond. It has been a great presentation, a great session. And thank you all for attending the webinar. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to have been invited.